Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for um, getting here on time. We were just kind of slightly delayed with other members to make sure we have quorum. Um, so we're going to start, and we might rejigger the agenda so that by the time we need to do official voting business, we have enough members in the room. So welcome, first meeting of 2018. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess the first order of business is we have, we want to welcome two new, uh, new board members. Um, we have uh, Nyla Lake Brown, and Nyla comes to us from private equity. She schooled me in this. I was like, I don't understand what you do. It's so complicated, but private equity. Um, She's uh, a managing director at Brookfield Asset Management um, and has a long a career in Morgan Stanley. <laughs> and um, uh, she's an artist and a dancer and um, founded um, Inner Visions Theater Arts Center in Queens. And so um, we're so excited and thank you for having Nyla on the board. So welcome, Nyla. And then we also have. Um, Alameda Chapman. Where are you, Alameda? There you are. Welcome, Alameda. Alameda is a high school senior from Uncommon um, Charter Schools in Williamsburg, and so we are so happy to have her, and she is soon on her way to Williams College. Um, so we are excited to have her perspective here on the board, and so welcome, Alameda. So please, everyone, take time at some point to connect with these two incredible individuals. Um, so welcome. Uh, we just want to turn your attention to the uh, packet here. If you'll notice um, in the packet, there will be these incredible directories. It's, it's this form here. Uh, there is one for youth board members and one for youth committee members. And essentially, uh, in our last conversation in December, um, we had talked about just wanting to orient ourselves because we meet quarterly sometimes. Um, it's easier to connect if we have everyone's bio and you know, who's sitting on the new board and who's on the committee and also connecting names to faces. So hopefully this will be a useful tool for you all. Please note that it is an evolving tool. It's not entirely complete. And so um, thank you to all the members who have submitted either the bios, bios and or photos. Um, if you haven't, please do so. That would be a great help uh, for all of us. As well, um, you will have a contact sheet in, in here. It's a little Excel form, and hopefully this will kind of facilitate any communication you'd like to have with each other on, uh, on the off times. Um, so thank you to the staff for putting this together. This is a great, great help. Are we at four minutes this point? Or All right, so next on the agenda is uh, thank you again uh, for braving the elements. Uh, we're a week from spring, just to remind you. So, uh, but there's no time to change, right? Um, a lot of, of what I was going to say is in the report, so I won't repeat it. Um, there's never a slow time at DYCD. Even in the winter months, there are things happening. It, it's truly incredible. It's a testament to the, the uh, ingenuity, entrepreneurship of our staff, that we're constantly engaged, doing things, involving our community partners. The one thing I do want to highlight, and I know Chris Lewis is going to talk about it, that we're excited about, is that uh, we haven't uh, launched the new request for proposal for the Summer Youth Employment Program, because we're still finalizing the budget with the OMB, but uh, we're able to uh, sort of phase in the school-based model, which we're very excited about, because it's the first time we can align the summer work experience with what young people learn in the school year. Uh, something that I've wanted to do for quite a while. Uh, we couldn't do it because the money was never uh, baseline, and so it's hard to redesign a program when more than half your budget, you don't know, until two weeks before the start of the program. So uh, thanks to the mayor of the city council a year or two ago, we have permanent, well, permanent as permanent gets in government, right, Nancy, uh, funding for uh, the city portion, which is close to 85% of the funding is city funding now. So that allows us to do the hard work. Uh, the other thing I, I do want to mention that we're thinking about, we have no details yet, but um, 
this is the 55th year of SYP. So, I know. I know. <laughs> yes, it's a good thing. So, in 2023, it will be 60 years. And so, one of the things we want to launch next year is a social media campaign uh, to get every young person, or person who was in the service employment program over the last 55, 56 years to tell us their stories of how that experience changed their lives. And what sparked this conversation, this thinking, was uh, I was at a meeting at City Hall um, three weeks ago. And I always get meetings early. And um, I you know, started a small talk with the uh, police officer at the police desk uh, outside the by, by the entrance of City Hall. And uh, she knew who I was. And then she told me how her first job was in some employment program. And then, yeah, and it's quite amazing how many people their first job was in some uh, former deputy mayor of Uri, uh, the commissioner of the mayor's office of domestic violence, uh, what's the guy from Sharp Lane? Uh, Raymond John. So I'm pretty sure that in the course of 55 years, a lot of famous and not so famous people have gone through the summary employment program. So I think to mark the 60th anniversary, <coughs> and I probably will not be here for the 60th anniversary, uh, but at least we should begin to lay the, the groundwork and, um, and tell the stories of how it is. I mean, there are people who, they were in the Serbian Employment Program, and their children were in the Serbian Employment Program. So that, that's very powerful because by my conservative estimate, if you did 30,000 young people a year, that's conservative, for 60 years, that's 1.8 million people. A lot of stories. So uh, that's something we uh, can talk next year. But uh, if you have ideas, send us your ideas. I was going to say it would be great if we could have, you know, very similar to the uh, what's it called, the storyline, the storyline, is to have some place where people could just walk in and oh. be able to tell, to tell their stories, some place where there are lots of people, you know, either oh. down at, you know. That's a good idea. I mean, we could uh, have our community centers. Yeah. That's a good idea. I mean, Part of this, so this is me thinking ahead, but uh, so that's sort of, and then the rest, if you have any questions on the report, I'll be glad to answer. Okay, so I think um, perhaps uh, uh, we will move to the presentation section of the agenda, and we'll do the official voting later on. So since, since November, the program committee has um, been on the cornerstones. We've talked a lot about the civic engagement. Oh, oh, Chris's presentation. Oh, scratch that. <laughs> um, so I guess next we're going to have Chris Lewis, the director of SYP, who will present on the new school-based and youth employment program model um, that aligns the students' academic learning and interests with their summer time. So Chris, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Uh, to those of you that uh, don't know me, I'm Chris. Lewis. I'm Chris Lewis, the uh, director of the Summit Employment Program. Um, I'm glad that uh, when the the, uh, the projector was turned on and the uh, computers turned on, it, it opened right to the USB homepage to show everyone in the room that the the, the Summit Youth Employment Program applications are being accepted now. Um, so for those of you. Um, that know of any of you that are interested in, in taking part, obviously you do if you're in this room, um, please continue to, to uh, you know, advocate and, and market and, and let folks know um, that if they're interested in participating in December 18, that uh, they, can, uh, they still have time to apply um, to do so. But uh, the reason that I'm here, and, and um, thank you Commissioner Chong for uh, um, outlining uh, what we and I led the discussion around some of the um, enhancements and um, recommendations that were that were made um, to, to look into how we can enhance the summer youth employment program going forward. So, um, just to, to give some context, um, obviously for those for those of you that are, are unfamiliar with SYEP in general, um, SYEP is essentially a, a six week jobs program. Um, that is administered by DYCD to uh, provide jobs to young people that live throughout the five boroughs of New York. Um, the, the basic goals of the program are to help young people uh, you know, through work readiness training and, and actual job uh, placement, 
uh, gain the soft skills uh, necessary in you know in any job that they may need going in the future, including communication, critical thinking, decision making, problem uh, solving skills, and self management. Uh, help young people understand career pathways and decision points, uh, including linkages between educational attainment, relevant experience, modular skills, and career advancement. Uh, introduce young people to the world of work. Um, you know, for I, I'm sure you all remember the first job you, you all had and how bewildering that experience uh, might have been on your first day. And it's it's very much a uh, you know up until that point you your you know all of your experiences relative to uh, the world of education and, and in school and, and, and it could be quite a bit of a culture shock for young people that make that transition in their first job. And so this we wanted this to be an opportunity to kind of um, help young people um, dip their toe in the pool, so to speak. And then, last but not least, of course, uh, provide a wage to young people, um, and with that wage, also help to to enforce uh, financial literacy and, and teach them how to manage money as well. Um, this, you know, as the commissioner noted, is a program that's been in existence since 1963. Um, but with the uh, after the you know, during the the budget negotiation process for um, the adopted budget for fiscal year 17. Um, as you know, as part of baselining the funding for the for the program uh, to help with it, its growth in, in the coming years, um, there there was a, a task force convened that the administration and, and the city council agreed that um, to look forward um, and, and to figure out how to um, you know enhance the the opportunities that people have through SYAP. It was important to convene you know key stakeholders um, that um, are impacted by SYAP. Um, and and have you know have you know experience with the program and have some very um, poignant and and important ideas for for ways to, to evolve the program to convene think about ways to um, to uh, provide recommendations to inform the the RFP process um, and one of the things that come out of that is um, you know there was a recognition that there there needed to be uh, a, a component of SYEP. To help strengthen the connections between uh, SYAP providers and public schools, right, and and through that uh, strength and connection, find ways to to enhance in school career development for young people by leveraging school resources. So essentially, you know, tying what young people are learning throughout the school day to the work readiness training they receive in preparation for work, and then ultimately the job placement they they uh, work in um, over the six weeks in the summer. Um, so, in taking those uh, recommendations in heart, um, we work to try to uh, model out uh, what we're calling the school-based SYAP model. And uh, this past fall, um, we released a short application um, in lieu of the, you know, because the RFP had been pushed back, we still wanted to take, um, you know, the recommendations gained from, from the task force and apply it in a way to, to essentially test the model out before we ultimately roll the RFP out. Um, some of the, the main components of this, of this new model is uh, that school leadership will play a key role in program implementation. Essentially, we're, having, we're bringing uh, the DOE and principals to the table and saying, listen, you know, we, want, we want to you know, have a more intentionalized connection um, between SYEP and, and the DOE and the, and the school system. How can we, uh, you know, how can we Essentially, sweeten the pot for you, make it make it as uh, make it something that's um, attractive to you to be able to come to the table and be a, a, an effective partner. And one of the things that we, a couple of the things that we looked at was having the principals be intimately involved in, in leading the recruitment for the program. As most of you know, SYEP is uh, for the, by by and large a lottery-based program. Uh, young people apply throughout the five boroughs, and then um, through random lottery, they're given an opportunity to take part in the program. Through this school-based model, we essentially carved out a section of services where um, schools will have the opportunity to to uh, recruit and and put and refer uh, young people directly into SYEP um, from their their uh, you know enrollment base. Uh, also, schools will have more input on these work readiness training and summer activities. So essentially, we're we're bringing uh, principals to the table to say, okay, here are the topics that we we covered in our work readiness training for SYEP. How can you know what can what you know adjustments or changes can we make to the individual curriculum for the youth at your school to tie with, tie into what they're actually learning during the school day, um, and then also uh, uh, 
principals are also pr uh, promising to uh, provide school space staff and other resources to help in the delivery of the program. So, uh, you know, one of the, the key distinctions of this program is also that youth are going to be receiving this work readiness training during the school year in school um, during after school hours. So, um, you know, again, trying to reinforce the, the connection between what they're learning in school and uh, the, the lessons learned from, from SYEP. Um, as part of that additional, um, you know, that con uh, connection, we're also expanding the number of hours youth will be spending in work readiness training from the four to, four to eight hours that we have for general SYP, we're, we're expanding that to 10 to 15 hours. Uh, this is due in large part to the resources being made available to us by, this, by the schools that are partnering um, with SYP. Having those additional resources allows the SYP providers to actually deliver um, additional training for, for young people that um, in many cases, you know, are, we'll, we'll see a, a, a great benefit from enhanced um, expanded hours of training. Um, and then a subset of youth, um, you know, uh, may also have the ability to receive school credit uh, through the Career Pool Enrichment Program. Um, this is a, um, a, a subset, a cohort of the school-based model where um, young people are receiving um, enhanced uh, career readiness training from um, uh, teachers that are uh, um, school staff that are hired by, um, to deliver this uh, course load and with the um, with it being delivered by school staff they actually have the opportunity to, to be eligible for receiving school credit um, and then beyond that you know all of this um, is then also um, rolled up into the, the typical six-week job opportunity that they'll have um, during the summer but of course with um, you know with school partners involved to help uh, find placements that, that more closely connect to <clears throat> what portion do the school staff do? Uh, the school staff deliver, if, if there is any work readiness training um, that involves uh, CDOS credentialing or uh, career clue, um, that training is actually being delivered by the school staff. Um, all other work readiness training is being delivered by the SYP. And are, are they placements in the school itself or school related? They, they can be. Um, you know, it's, especially in uh, a subset of the placements also involve uh, service learning opportunities, and a lot of um, a lot of those uh, opportunities would require space. And with that, um, with the provision that the schools are, are you know, putting forth those resources to help those providers, um, those service learning opportunities will be taking place as well. Um, so, as for as far as uh, how we rolled it out for summer 2018. Um, there were 32 schools uh, that were <coughs> awarded SYEP, uh, school-based SYEP programs. Um, when we looked um, at implementation, the, the target was to focus on uh, community and career technical education schools, um, as we, we felt like this was the group that was, uh, DOE felt that, that the group, this is the group of schools that um, seek to gain the most benefit from an expansion in connection to, to SYEP. Um, these 32 schools are partnered with 18 SYP providers uh, to the the program, so there are a number of providers that are partnered with multiple schools. Um, the program, uh, we were intentional, we were, you know, we were wanted to, this to be a focused uh, program, so we didn't uh, scale it out too, too large, so there's only a maximum of 150 youth that can serve through this cohort at each school. Um, and the, the plan is for uh, these services to serve uh, about 5,000 youth uh, during summer So essentially, uh, there was a list of schools that the DOE uh, put forward as being eligible for the program. Um, those schools, and, and I kind of uh, lost over it, those schools had to have a, a conversation with SYEP providers to, to um, determine if they were interested in actually taking part in school-based SYEP. If they were interested in taking part in school-based SYEP, they had to enter into a school partnership agreement, basically outlining the responsibilities of the school, responsibilities of the SYEP provider, and essentially codifying that in, uh, in anticipation of uh, the competitive process to, to determine which SYEP providers would receive those services. So, um, so essentially, basically, the, pro the process was the schools were, were having meetings and interviews with a myriad of, of potential SYEP providers, the providers that they were interested in partnering with, they signed into school partnership agreements with those schools, and then uh, we here at DYCD, with, with some help from uh, the DOE, uh, reviewed proposals from each of the SYP providers to determine which provider was going to get the, uh, the award to provide the services. Are there any schools that are not eligible for the SYP program? Uh, 
understand that you know all the years of working in school-based programs, the most key thing is principal buy-in. The worst thing to do is to tell a principal you shall do this. Right, that's why I asked the question. And so, so they bought, they self-selected to DOE, and then DOE gave us a list, and then the principals had to had to say and who they wanted to work with, because you know we've learned the hard way when you try to have shotgun weddings, it never works. Right. Well, also I'll just say I'm John Pendleton. So our office was actively involved in this, the Office of Post-Secondary Readiness. Mm -hmm. We oversee the Career and Technical Education Program, and David Fisher and our office and others have worked with community schools in a pilot program that's been going on for several summers. So we were also working very actively to talk to our schools that we're already working with um, and had an idea of which ones would be willing and interested and gave them some lay of the land as well. So there was a, there was a a concentrated effort centrally from DOE and help coordinate and get people on board. So it was like both of us working together to get them to the door. And uh, we're also looking forward to the RP being released so that more of the vendors that we work with, because we have a whole effort around bringing school partners and hoping that those um, companies, employers can actively get involved in some intermediaries that we work with that are um, industry focused uh, can also be part of this through the new RFP. So there was coordination from Central to get people ready to participate in this. And does the school, do the schools themselves get incentive payments of some sort to participate? Um, no, the, the, the only payments that are um, the budget for this program is essentially being paid solely to the SYP providers. Um, yeah, there, there isn't any, any funding going from UICD to So the that's why people have to volunteer. Yeah. Right. There, there is no mind. So, because we're asking principals to do something that they're not used to doing, which is have staff work in the summer. So they really have to want to do it, not because they're told to do it. It can't be top down. It has to be really bottom up. And so I think there is going to be a ceiling to how many schools participate simply because we're asking, some, we're asking for them to kick in resources, uh, make space available during the summer, staff time that's in high, so they have to find money in their budgets to do this. So it's really, I'm, quite frankly, I'd rather do fewer but better than to just try to do a, a large number and then there's people, people walking through the commitment. And so I think, you know, we, working with Tom and his staff, I think we really came up with a, a good subset of schools wanting to be part of this. Right, and, and you know, just because there there isn't any, like, monetary, you know, reimbursement going to, to the schools, there, there still is a uh, you know, strong incentive for them to take part in, in SYP, right? Numerous studies have come out that, that indicate that participation in SYP has you know, numerous educational benefits for young people that take part in it. You know, the uh, attendance and grades um, have, uh, have been shown to, to be improved um, uh, for youth that take part in SYP. So, um, you know, and with, with this partnership, we're essentially you know, giving schools and, and principals the opportunity to give youth from their schools kind of a, a, a leg up and, and a, you know, an opportunity to, to, to really, you know, I don't want to say poor guarantee, but reserving services for youth from their school. So, I mean, that alone, I think, is a very strong incentive for the, for the principals that are, that are partnering with um, schools. That's why and I would just add, like, so many of the schools already have an existing relationship with the CEO, you know, through learning to work, through community partnerships, through other kinds of programs. So oftentimes it's not, if they already have that going on in their school, then they see it as a plus. It's not such a big sell to say, hey, right. look, we can get 100, 100 kids employed this summer. And the wages get paid by DYCD. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing I've heard exactly. from DOE, is that we don't have money to pay wages. Right. 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 Chris, 32 schools were accepted or were awarded. How many applied? Um, there were, I believe, the list of the total list of schools that were eligible for the school base SYP. I believe it was up to about 43 schools. Something like 50, I think. Up to about 50. Yeah. 50 applied or 50 were eligible? 50 were eligible. eligible. So the schools don't apply. The yes, so they, the the procurement it was for SYP providers. The SYP providers we connected the SYP providers with the schools in anticipation for the procurement. So essentially, we wanted to make sure before proposal even came to, to the table for us to, to you know, award uh, this program that 
a connection had been made and an agreement had come, had been come to between the SYP provider and the school. So 50 were eligible and 32 opted in. Or were recruited or, by yeah. your they, they, they had guys assigned a school partnership agreement. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Some didn't have anyone who courted them. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, the one thing that Tom mentioned that I want to encourage uh, youth board members to consider is that since we have a window of opportunity before the RFP is released this fall, is to really drum up interest among people who currently don't do the program. Because the new models, will, we want to increase the number of, of young people served in the public housing developments, the 15 MAP sites. You know, we want to increase the number of vulnerable youth. So there's you know, different skills uh, that, you know, so the, the universe of people we have are the ones from 2011. Is that the last RFP we did? I think 2011. So uh, there are more groups out there. Uh, you know, for example, I, I engaged the Fresh Air Fund. Uh, to see if they'd be interested in doing a program because we have uh, we have uh, programs that do work have young people in summer camp up the state mm -hmm. so they've never been part of it so if you know agencies that have historically never been in SYP but one of the new models and there's is it nine models I always forget the RFP has nine 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 different options there's an option for somebody. Uh, the, the majority of the schools are actually in the Bronx, uh, followed closely by uh, uh, Brooklyn and Queens, then that happens um, there. And is that list available now? Um, have, have the decisions been made? Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. Yes. yeah so we're going to do a press release uh, probably Great. next week, so we can share that with you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because um, we, wanted to make, we didn't want to get ahead of DOE and the principals. And then we also want a lot of quotes from, you know, success as many uh, parents. So the, this is going to be a lot of people want to get a quote into the press release. So we want to do it next week, and so we'll share it with you. Great. Hi, um, I'm David Fisher. I'm from the New York City Center for Youth Employment, and just wanted to say. Um, uh, my colleagues here from DYCD are a little bit underselling uh, what an important development this is in the evolution of the program. As the commissioner said, uh, SYP has been around more than 50 years uh, and has positively impacted the lives of, I like your estimate, but I'm going to kick it up a little bit, 2 million New Yorkers over that period. Um, but the impact's always been a little bit limited because you have what happens during 10 months of the school year and then six weeks in the summer. Uh, what's so exciting about the school-based option is that it begins to put those pieces together to create a year-round continuum of experience for our young people. So I just want to thank Commissioner Chong and Chris and the entire workforce team for really doing something remarkable, and Tom and his colleagues at DOE for being great, great partners in all this. Uh, from the perspective of my shop, uh, this is what we were sort of called into existence to try to help make happen and what we've most wanted to see. So th thanks to all of you and thanks to the youth board and youth council members for your, for your support of this. Thank you. I'm with the Program Quality and Innovation Union. I've been um, in Compass, and I've been on that team uh, for about two and a half years now. 
um, where uh, when I came on board, um, we were entering a really great phase at DYCD where there was a focus on youth leadership and civic engagement um, and really building out um, what are the tenets of youth leadership development across all of our um, res respective units. Um, so as you may know, um, we do have a shared vision for youth leadership development. This is not anything new. Um, if you guys remember our teen action program, um, which is grounded in service learning and, um, and that was headed by uh, Tracy Garcia, um, we've been doing this, we've been in the business of youth leadership development and we wanted to take those best practices um, from Teen Action and figure out a way to embed it into all of our respective units. So what we were finding is that our units individually had um, definitions in there around youth leadership development. Um, we figured out that units were operating, for example, Cornerstone, there's the advisory board or Beacon, right? They have an advisory board and they recommend or encourage young people to be a part of it. Um, in the Sonic initiative, there's a two-hour youth leadership requirement that all of our providers are required to offer youth leadership opportunities for young people. Um, but we were operating in silos, um, so we came together to think about ways to support this on a larger scale, um, which, um, as you guys know, um, we rolled out a huge Promote the Positive. Um, and I'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with that, but we rolled out frameworks around positive youth development, social emotional learning, and youth leadership. Um, and what we did was we built our internal capacity first. We recognized that it was important for our internal program management staff, our deputy director staff, that we're going out and evaluating programs to have a firm foundation around what youth leadership development is and what it means to DYCD. Um, so we started there. We did a lot of internal trainings um, for all of the respective units. We also um, trained um, master trainers, which was really, really cool. Um, so we had master trainers represented in each unit that they also did more intentional work with their smaller units. So they led Promote the Positive meetings. Um, when they were having team debriefs or um, discussing a portfolio, they made it a point to be inclusive around the language that they were using around positive youth development. Um, but then we also then branched out more broadly and started to share this message with our external providers. Um, so I want to give you a snapshot of the youth leadership framework. Um, so we worked with AIR, American Institute for Research, to build out this amazing youth leadership framework, which really serves as a foundation for our youth leadership program. So there's an intentional focus on skills and attitudes. Um, there's an intentional focus around creating the right environment for youth leadership opportunities, all grounded in research. Um, there is the le learn by doing piece. So you can't have youth leadership without leadership and action, right? So we're firm believers, and yes, it's great to have young people um, fill out uh, worksheets around their goals and what it is that they want to do, but we also know the importance of them giving back to their communities, but also giving back to themselves, where they can build in these skills. And then there's a core area on reflecting on action. So this sounds very youth-focused, which it is, and it should be, but it's also um, a tool that we've developed to support our providers in building their capacity to understand youth leadership and train their youth workers. Um, so there are TA providers in our capacity build building unit, um, YDI, they use this framework to support the ongoing um, training that they're doing throughout our agency. So this is folded into every conversation. So if we're having a youth leadership conversation, we are all saying the same thing. And that was super important for us um, back in 2015 to make sure that we were doing. Um, so that brings me to like the NYC Young Citizens Competition. So um, in 2015, um, we teamed up with the Service Learning Unit um, led by Tracy Garcia to say, hey, we have all of these great initiatives, right? Sonic, we have these, this two hour leadership requirement. We're gonna roll out the Sonic Game Changers you have this amazing teen action program, Step It Up exists, where it's Step in um, social justice, right? Why not build it where we can have all of our um, providers, regardless of what unit um, your contract is in, um, be a part of this amazing initiative? So we took the best practices from each of these smaller initiatives and folded it into one larger initiative um, that is open to every young person that's in DYCD between the ages of 11 to 18. 
um, which is amazing. Um, and once we brought providers in and had that conversation, they were like, wow, this is so great. Um, our young people, what we find is that our young people during, throughout the conference are really excited to meet other young people that are doing um, and engaging in youth leadership and doing this exciting work. Um, so NYC Young Citizens Competition is the action-driven, youth-led, um, focused competition where youth develop at their respective sites um, individual, um, individual projects. Um, they go through and um, conduct needs assessments. They go ahead and do community walks to determine like what are the um, needs for our young people um, in, in the community. And then they design and develop this competition, right? Um, so teams advocate for change, inform peers, or highlight a need. Um, youth compete to win school prizes and to present their winning projects. So yes, there are some amazing incentives built into that. Um, but what the carrot for our young people and what we encourage our providers to share with the youth that um, intend to um, compete is that you are winning an opportunity to share your message um, and spread it more broadly with young people across New York City. Um, so we typically have um, youth um, compete from all the five boroughs. I'm so happy to see Staten Island in there. We'll have like three or four um, competitors in, in Staten Island. Um, teams of youth can range anywhere from five to 20 participants, um, which was important for us because we recognize that a group of young people could be anywhere between 15 to 20 on site in a program. Um, so we have five to 20 um, youth from respective agencies compete. Um, in addition to that, it's the how, right? Like how do young people compete? Like how do we set this up so that young people can um, walk away with an intentional experience? So we design themes um, that we ask young people to go ahead and brainstorm on. Um, we, of course, give them the option to say, you can select more than one theme. Um, and we recognize that there is a lot of intersection between many of these themes, and our young people discover that too, which is also exciting and a part of the learning that they do. Um, and then once they decide on a theme as a, as a group, they then compete in one of the three competitions, um, peer to peer yeah. workshop, expo presentation, and performance presentation. So the peer to peer presentation, again, built from the best practices from our team action program, where they're standing in front of a classroom, right? They build out a 45 minute to 60 minute workshop, um, they design it, they think about the reflection piece that has to happen, they think about the intro, they figure out what is the skill or the takeaway for the young people um, in that classroom at that moment, and then they facilitate the workshop. So we have adult volunteers in the room to support, of course, the group management, but the young people go in and they lead that classroom, um, which is really, really interesting and cool. We've had young people um, that have developed a PSA they went ahead and it was a PSA on anti-bullying, and instead of um, using this PSA in our performance part of the, the day, they decided that they wanted to do a peer-to-peer -peer learning experience. So they had the young people view the PSA, and then from that, they um, built out questions and an interactive um, workshop for them to kind of like build out the learning that they developed from that um, PSA, which was great. Um, then we have the expo presentation, so think science fair, um, but way cooler. Um, so one of the cool things about the expo is um, this is the track for um, our young presenters who don't necessarily see themselves in a classroom. Um, they may have developed a cool interactive display that they want to showcase. So I'll give you an example. We had a UAU program um, out in Staten Island and they, their project was around um, drug prevention. As you know, there's like the huge opioid crisis out in Staten Island, and the young people there recognize that as a major issue for them. So they went ahead and did all of this service learning. They went to various um, facilities. They connected with the NYPD. Um, they um, met with um, young people who were in rehab facilities to talk about what are those conversations that need to happen for our young people to prevent this from continuing on. Um, and from that, they birthed this amazing concept. So they led their own youth conference, but it was for parents. So it was really cool to witness because they took ownership. They were in the auditorium of their school. And their parents were there and they were questioning their parents. Like, how are you talking to your daughter, your son around drug abuse and drug prevention? 
and parents were like, oh, uh, well, you know, and they actually had moments where they also supported the adults in building out open-ended questions that they could address with their young people around this topic, which was great and amazing. But they didn't stop there. So they were challenged with the idea that um, most young people um, aren't out on the island and they don't necessarily know the community. Right, so how can we have the young people that attend this conference buy into this being a major issue? They created this virtual reality tour of their neighborhood, which was like amazing. They had um, the virtual glasses, they um, programmed basically a walking tour of their neighborhood, and at every point, whether it was, oh, we're gonna walk over now to the rehab facility for teens that we visited, they had info and facts. So young people who maybe were, have never been out to Staten Island were able to walk through their neighborhood and experience why this was such a big issue, right? Um, so the Expo track are for our creative thinkers um, who want to go beyond like a traditional classroom setting, which is also important and impactful, but this is another way for them to do, to do that. And that was built from the best practices of the Sonic Game Changer um, initiative that we built out. The last competition category is the performance and entertainment presentation, and this came from um, best practices and Step It Up um, in our poetry initiatives that we have at DYCD, where you take social justice, social action, um, and put it in, in a performance piece where um, young people can relate to it. So we've had steppers, we've had spoken word artists, that highlight a community issue, and they do it through art, and we're hoping this year, fingers crossed, that we have um, a visual art in, in some capacity um, for this performance piece. So that would be the first ever um, at this competition. Um, the application process, so I'm not gonna go through too much of that with you guys, but it's an online application process through SurveyMonkey, um, open to all DYCD youth um, and providers that are interested. Um, but there is a video requirement, which I'm gonna let you guys kind of like get a sense of what, um, our youth come up with and submit, which is really cool. <laughs> Um, so that's, um, so 
each team is required to submit a two to three minute video um, outlining um, what they've done, what they've been working on, um, and it gives our judges, which are actually our program managers and deputy directors from all of the units, an opportunity to get a sense of like the team personality and who they are, because you know judging on paper is really hard. Um, we don't necessarily know, and um, it's also blind judging, so all the information regarding the providers are blocked out, so our waiters aren't able to, you know, you know. Um, so yes, um, so. I want to kind of like end this conversation um, with when you need change can happen. So um, our first year of doing this, we had a Canva provider um, that is a shelter-based program in Brownsville um, submit and, part and participate. And I remember um, the director, her name was Natasha, um, from Brownsville, she came and after the info session, she was like, you know, I don't think my young people can do this. They are like dealing with so much, they have so much on their plate, um, their families are tra in transition, um, sometimes they're here, sometimes they're not, you know, we can start with a group of young people and then they leave. Um, and we had to encourage her that, you know, if you give young people the pathway to lead, they will lead and they will blow your mind. Um, so they had two teams submit and both teams actually won the competition that year, right? Um, so there was one team that submitted a project around um, art advocacy. Um, so when they walked into the shelter space, there was no, it was like a, a bare wall with nothing on it. And the young people were really saddened by that because they're like, how am I supposed to be inspired? Like, how is my family supposed to be inspired to move on um, from this place if, if our environment doesn't necessarily reflect the hope, right, that um, our staff are instilling in us um, and, and want us to believe. So they decided to do a mural project around um, hope and um, inspiring images um, to support the families and, and feeling better when they walk into the space. So that was one of their projects. The second project that they did was around web access um, in the shelter and in their community. So the young people um, really championed this because they felt that they didn't have the access that they needed on site to support um, doing their homework, and then they recognized that their families didn't have web access or computers in order to fill out job applications or follow up on appointments, right? Something that sometimes we take a little for granted. So they went ahead and um, developed this survey that they executed at all of their respective schools, which is interesting. So they developed this questionnaire for youth around web access and technology access and what do you do to, how do you complete your homework or how do you research things. And what they found is that throughout the, I think it was four schools in, in, that surrounded the uh, shelter, that most of their young people do not have web access or tech access at home, right? They were really bothered by that, right? What they thought was just an isolated issue in their shelter, they recognized it was a larger issue within their community. So they went ahead and developed um, this project called Get Current, where they um, really researched um, the importance of having tech and web access and the disparities that exist in Brownsville and maybe due to the fact that they don't have access to this information, right? Or to this technology. So, I'll show you real quick. Oh, that's so good. What if you need to the job application? Is that relating to the kids getting jobs or um, let us staff? Mean that the staff? What if they care staff? What if you have to have jobs and get those jobs? No, like, 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 the case may be, but both, yeah, right? But there is a really cool update um, regarding this competition project. Let me get 
it was clear to us there was no youth voice in the program. Uh, although the staff of the CDO says there was, but the young people said there weren't. <laughs> and so that sort of led to this whole agency wide discussion about how can we infuse a youth voice in the programs that we develop. And I think, you know, given events in Parkland, it's clear that young people can move the needle on the dial on a lot of issues. And so uh, and the mayor himself has made democratization a big key focus of the next few years of this administration. And ideally, um, the new deputy mayor who we will be reporting to, Phil Thompson, is also very interested in this. And he and I shamefully met each other when we were teenagers, <laughs> as young activists. Um, I've known for close to 40 years, well, more than 40 years. So, um, so we're living proof that, you know, if you get young people involved, uh, great things can happen. Terrific, by the way. Really, yeah. congratulations, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. And we're really excited this year because we feel like, um, with all the climate that's going around in the country, we know that our young people tap into that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're excited to see. I don't judge the the uh, projects I'm too close to it, um, but I'm really interested to see this year what our young people have been doing um, in their communities in response to everything that's changing for them. Um, so which is, which will be interesting. So yes. Can I just, if, I, I don't know whether it's appropriate or not, but for, for some of us who sit on either the youth board or the, or the youth committee, and often trying to find ways in which we can be helpful, um, not just to listen, mm -hmm. and whether or not this time or going forward, if you need like volunteers for judges, we, we're not, I, I speak for myself, I'm not connected to a particular organization, is that I hope that you open that yeah. up if that's something that would be Oh, definitely. Um, something that we're thinking about, and Anthony um, um, is, is creating the pathways for us to do so, is that we're bringing in, um, and I don't know, Anthony, if you want to talk a little bit about the participatory budget people coming in yeah. to um, talk with I our providers. But, but I think, I think to Ray's point, I think we, we can look at seeing how to get you all involved in, in judging the oh, competition. So we can definitely follow by that. But what Chris was referring to, and this also ties into what we're trying to do to look at how we support youth civic engagement in our programs is that um, we're going to start to partner more with the city council on their participatory budgeting uh, uh, initiative. Is everyone familiar with that? Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, real quick, members <coughs> opt in, they set aside a million, a million dollars in capital funds, and they have a whole process where they work with the community, and they run assemblies, budget delegates to surface the projects. Vote week is coming up. Um, it's April 7th to 15th, and community members can vote up vote up to five projects. There's a list of 20 that they choose, and the budget delegates you know, whittle it down, right? So what we want to do moving forward is figure out how to get more of our DYCD funded mm -hmm. programs involved. Mm -hmm. um, to date, the programs that have been involved are mostly are our cornerstone community mm -hmm. centers, uh, but I think moving forward, we have so many other after-school programs, our beacons, um, community development programs that can get involved. And it's really a way to engage young people um, and communities in a real kind of way. I mean, these, these votes happen every year. These council members set aside our money every year. And, there's, and you know, it's a concrete project that they can vote on, like for school improvements, park improvements, other community center improvements. Um, and it's, it's uh, been pretty successful for the council, and we're looking forward to helping to promote that effort further uh, because it ties into what we want to do with our funding program. So at the Young Citizens Conference this year, we will have some people from the city council attend to present about that. So, you know, to kind of prime the pump, you know, as another way for uh, the organizations to get involved in another type of uh, civic activity. And, and what's exciting about it is that um, young people from the ages 14 up can actually vote on the projects that win. So there's a whole incentive to engage and get other young people to vote on projects that maybe you have designed for your community. So it's a, it's a really great program. And I would just add that um, not only as judges is, is, is a great role, but also attending yes. the expo and do, mimicking what those young people at Baruch did and seeing how we can maybe choose one and, and connect, mm -hmm. use, use your individual yeah. networks to, to make these amazing Share people regarding it, um, and also to you. Uh, we actually do not have a form. Yeah, including the media 
Yeah, Mia Jones is on the phone. Uh, we're, we're short one for a call. All right. But sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Oh, no, so I was going to say that, you know, we are always interested in having adults support this event in whatever capacity. Um, and even if you feel like there's opportunities for you to share your message with even our providers. So this year, what will be new and that we're introducing to the conference is that while the young people are engaging in their workshops, we're also going to have technical assistance workshops for providers to continue the conversation around youth voice and choice and building out sustainable practices that support inclusion in their agencies. Um, so we welcome um, volunteers and folks that are interested in the function. So we'll send some follow-up information about how that will get involved. What this means logistically is that um, we're going to need to reconvene perhaps on a phone call where we can have members actually go to um, uh, to the memorial of what we are hoping to do. So um, we, we sent, Anthony sent an email, I want to say probably last week, with some of the proposed changes that we wanted to present. So first on the bylaw um, changes. Uh, there were two things that we would like to propose um, for your vote and approval. One is a change of address for um, the, from 123 Williams, uh, oh, to 123 Williams, where we are now. Um, it has an old address, so we would need to vote on an official update and change of address on that. The other item uh, we worked on was um, refashioning the secretary position. So this is an officer position on the board. And there was a lot of discussion around how to uh, refashion and make it more strategic and engaging um, to look at beyond minute taking. Um, and so um, what we are proposing is a refashioned um, officer from secretary to a secretary and engagement officer. And basically, the change is, I'm reading the language that is in the bylaws that we're proposing, is the secretary and engagement officer shall develop and implement strategies to strengthen the board's cohesion, encourage participation, and support um, and support the execution of its powers, duties, and responsibilities. And essentially, the thinking is that we'd like this position to just be more robust and to work with engaging youth board members. Um, there's so much experience and expertise and so much work to do. We thought that this would be a um, more strategic use of the expertise of the youth board member. So on the phone, I guess we're going to need to reconvene and um, vote on these two specific changes. Is there any questions on those changes? The, the, the change of address, you said it's what? The change of address is going to be from the old address is, uh, the old address was 156 Williams, which no longer exists, and the agency is now 123 Williams. So if that's a change update. Okay, thank you. We're not allowed to vote amongst us, at least record our vote, and so the people that are missing can uh, be presented with the options? That's a wonderful question. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know anything. There's nothing in the bottles that would prevent us from doing that. I feel like I would just officially, just officially want to run it by our legal folks. I mean, it's a good suggestion. Um, we can take, keep that into account for the next time. But I think what our legal folks did tell us ahead of today, because we're fearing that maybe there were to be enough members to perform, is that there's nothing in our bylaws or in other city laws that prevent us from reconvening on a call to do the vote. So um, I think I would still want us to proceed it that way, but. Sandy has a good suggestion for the future if we ever encounter this situation. Um, but I think given that we just discussed it right now, we'll just call it a quick call. It'll be like five minutes of time. Just have a quorum, all the eyes have it, and then we'll be official. So, um, and we'll make sure we'll find a time in the next week that works for everyone. It'll we'll just be real quick. And again, this is just for youth board members. This is for youth board members, not for youth committee members. This is for 
Yeah, yeah. And the importance of, of solidifying this change is because it impacts also um, nominating um, a person to fulfill this officer position. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Liz and talk about that. So once the position is approved, and again, we'll do this on the call, but we'd like to, the nominations committee would like to present Jordana Lee for the position. Um, I think you're all very familiar with her, but she is the director of the David Rubenstein Atrium at the Lincoln Center, um, and it is Lincoln Center's arm for providing free arts to the community. She's been a great member so far of the youth board, and she's taken on a Ladders for Leaders last year, encouraged Lincoln Center to do so, um, and she's very excited about this. Unfortunately, her flight was canceled last night due to the pending weather, so she couldn't be <laughs> she here. She was the one boat we needed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but she's very excited to work with the board, and again, just one example, the, the great suggestion of having um, youth board and youth committee leaders serve as judges the Secretary of Engagement um, and uh, the Secretary and Engagement Officer would kind of take that as a cross to follow up with um, both DYCD and the board to make that happen. So it's things like that to connect us with how we can support DYCD further. That's kind of why we made the change. So hopefully the call will be short and sweet, but Jordana is our nomination. So we're, um, we're... What we can do is yes. vote on the minutes. We have form uh, we have form for the minutes. We have form for the minutes. <laughs> so that's so what you vote in, you can do. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, well, we can get business done here. Um, so I, um, thank you, so we'll follow up with you um, to schedule that call relatively soon. Um, uh, I just want to thank the standards nominations committee, I'm saying that wrong, um, and Liz for all your work um, on making this happen, So, and Anthony, of course. Um, so I guess now if we'll turn to the last, uh, the December meeting minutes, if I could, uh, everyone has to read them, and if there is a motion to approve the minutes. Great. Thank you, Ray. Is there a second? Thank you, Sandy. Um, all in favor of approving December meeting minutes? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, thank you. Approved. How efficient we are as a group. <laughs> um, great, so I guess we just have a few more minutes. I, I wanted to just mention a couple things. Um, I, I hope, uh, you know, Commissioner Chong mentioned, uh, you know, Parkland students and the uh, upcoming March for Our Lives. So I encourage you all um, to participate and support our young people and remind them that young people have always led significant change in this country. And so we are certainly looking to them and we are feeling optimistic that they're going to make things happen. So um, that's coming up. Also in June, we had discussed. Um, uh, doing maybe a site visit or meeting in a particular location, one of the DYCD programs. So that's something we're looking to program. Um, so just kind of keep it in your minds that it's very possible a June meeting will be on an, in another location. Of course, we'll keep you posted as we kind of work out what that looks like. Um, also, we will be having a programs committee meeting, and for those of you who are interested, you will be receiving notice on, I don't think the date is set. Okay, so probably probably end of the month, early April, um, the meeting is going to uh, look at kind of cross citywide uh, multiple um, boards and agencies that are youth focused. There was a real interest in looking, you know, at the thirty thousand foot level to better understand how we kind of work together and move initiatives forward. Um, so more information forthcoming on that, and please join in programs committee. Um, has done really, really incredible work. Um, and lastly, you will be receiving a list of activities of opportunities for involvement, and there is um, no dearth of that. There's so much work happening out there, and it's so exciting, so you'll be receiving that um, very soon. Um, I guess that is it for kind of just some brief announcements. If any of you have questions, announcements, anything you'd like to share with the board, that would be great. 
I, I just have a question about how we're supporting any young people for the 24th. Are we, I saw an announcement in the, in the Times about how they're, the, the young people are soliciting funders to help support, take to take young people to D.C. for the 24th. I don't know what's being organized in New York. Uh, but is, if there is, are we facilitating or encouraging our CBOs to go? I think it would be a great experience for them if they're moved to go. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the response has been. Yeah, it's a good mm -hmm. question. I don't know. I mean, I, there's, there's all kinds of limits on how city money can be used. So <coughs> I'm not sure uh, it's a clear yes or no as to say, oh, we want to rent a bus. I'm, I don't know the legal answer to that. I mean. Sometimes people can do things locally in support of it, and that might be probably the best thing that will happen, because everything we do, every dollar that's spent is always subject to an audit by somebody. So that's, I'm always mindful of just saying, you can spend money on going to a protest. That, that probably comes back to bite us at some point. Yeah, so there are a couple of things, Sandy, that I've seen. Um, certainly, uh, there are several members that are um, chartering buses and opening up spaces for young people from the community or just any community members. Um, there is an essentialized. I think there's a lot happening. There's also going to probably be a local New York um, march for those who can't make it to D.C., which we're also encouraging. And you know, there's a walkout happening this week. And All right. Tomorrow. 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 There you go. Tomorrow. Tomorrow um, that there has been a lot of work to make sure that you know young people can also walk out and not suffer any particular consequences. We know you know that plays out differently in different neighborhoods, but there's been a real intentionality around supporting young people, supporting their places. So I don't think there's a, there's a <coughs> focal point where people could go to get access to the buses. I think. I'll I think that all the activities that were presented here are great. And I just have a question regarding the college tours for students. Uh, being that I work in higher education, I was just going to college. I am open to receiving youth uh, to different college tours and to expose them to career alternatives. I think that it's something that you should think of and consider. Um, that's basically what I'm thinking. Of. I mean, we have, we have, you know, a lot of workforce programs. So, you know, just uh, follow with Anthony. He'll get the word out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I feel like the talk show goes. Say what else? Great. Um, I guess. With that, I just want to thank you all for making time this morning. Um, thank you for the, to the staff for the presentations and all the great work that you're doing. And please, let's be in communication. You have everyone's emails and bios. Let's continue to support more placements for SYP, more ladders for leaders, more um, civic engagement for our young people and communities. And so just thank you and, and safe travels up there. I don't know what and welcome to our new members. Yes. Yes. Welcome. Thank you.